So um, I'll just introduce myself first. Uh, I did my initial training in Turkey and I did a fellowship at UCSF. Um, and after fellowship, I stayed as a faculty. I've been practicing uh, spine surgery for 20 years. Um, my main focus are more, you know, complex reconstructive surgeries, deformity tumor. Um, and uh, initially it was like almost 50-50, but nowadays it's almost like, you know, 80% deformity. And uh, I do small amount of degenerative surgery, cervical and lumbar spine. And when we think about the anterior approach, historically, it first started with the pot disease. Uh, because of the pot disease, anterior location and granuloma formation, uh, it has to be drained anteriorly. Um, uh, and the um, after actually, we rarely see that, that you know problem at this point. It's more common in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, then actually we start using the technique for deformity surgeries and we realized that releasing the anterior column achieves significant uh, deformity correction. Uh, and then actually becomes more and more common and popular with the disc replacement surgery because uh, clinical trial required vascular surgeon performing the approaches because of the potential vascular risks. And we train a lot of access surgeons um, and um, there are multiple, you know, over the after the disc replacement, this very common approach with the disc replacement. Then, last 15 years, there are multiple anterior lateral approaches of the spine become widely adopted. Um, these approaches allow wide exposure of the disc space for large interbody graft, shorter operative time, less blood loss, and uh, more so, we realize that this restoring the disc height gives us an indirect decompression of the neurological tissue. But in general, like you know, what we do as a spine surgery, our goal is to decompress the nerves, stabilize the spine, and achieve a good alignment. So these approaches actually widely being used currently is the ALIF anterior lumbar interbody diffusion, uh, ALIF. Uh, or more commonly, we call it XLIF uh, because it was popularized to new, by invasive transverse lateral interbody diffusion, OLIF uh, anterior to psoas or oblique lumbar interbody diffusion, and most recently PTP or prone lateral, the new transverse uh, and performing the lateral surgery in prone position. Uh, primary surgical goal of all these four procedures to, you know, to implant the uh, lateral disc space possible with the interbody graft, achieve a good fusion rate and maximize the, you know, segmental loaders and achieving a significant disc height provides indirect de neural decompression by expanding the foramen as well as, you know, that achieved it by doing distracting the ligaments. Um, because a lot of the central stenosis related to ligaments folding because of disc space loss. When you distract the disc space by ligament attacks, then you achieve a uh, decompression of the central canal as well. And also we learned a lot of uh, important stuff during the anatomy. I mean, I remember during the fellowship or training, I think we rarely you know, train our trainees or I barely discussed about the lumbar plexus. Um, we know the vascular anatomy, segmental arteries, iliac, you know, vessels. Uh, um, and we start looking at the MRI uh, also differently, not only you know, just looking at the canal, we start looking at the position of the vascular uh, structures. We start looking at the neurovascular uh, lumbar plexus. And really important to look at the MRI, especially, you know, about 10% of the population have transitional segment because of the transitional segment bifurcation of the you know vessels could be far laterally located especially at the l4 5, l5 levels uh, that's really critical to identify those vessels by looking at the mri and identifying the locations um, to prevent the potential vascular injuries and also you know we identify that the muscle anatomy changes because a lot of these surgeries are performed either anterior to psoas or through the transverse approach. Uh, transitional segment, if the patients have uh, lumbarized or sacralized 
lumbar spine, the L4, L5 could be L5, L6, and the psoas actually looks like advancing, you know, when it is advancing through the pelvis, it goes more, more and more anterior. So you can see on these images that you can see that the, we call Mickey Mouse uh, approach. Uh, so extensive interoperative image review is critical for especially, you know, optimal lateral interbody fusion surgery. So um, when it comes to the ALF, uh, it becomes very popular with the, you know, when we train a lot of vascular surgeons to do the total disc replacement. Um, the, there are significant advantages. There is no disruption to the posterior structures. There is no nerve root retraction as necessary. Uh, you can place large structural space possible with large graft area for fusion and alignment correction can be performed open, mini open or laparoscopically. All that is no longer that common. There are also disadvantages of the vascular, you know, anterior aid of approach. Um, there's vascular risks. Um, and a lot of times actually it's really, you know, access surgeon dependent. Uh, and currently, you know, we have a lot of access surgeons in Europe, a lot of countries actually, the spine surgeons do their own anterior approaches. Um, because in a lot of countries, the compensation of the procedure is not separate for the different surgeries. It's just the one compensation. So there is no incentive for the vascular surgeons to do, you know, the spine approach. But here in the U.S., actually a lot of vascular surgeons and access surgeons enjoy performing the procedures because they are very well compensated. One of the other problems, especially for young male population, is retrograde ejaculation. Um, if you damage the um, autonomic nervous system around the anterior column that might lead to a retrograde ejaculation. Uh, usually requires stabilization with, you know, you can use standalone cages. Um, uh, if um, fixation is not available anteriorly, you can, you, you probably need to do posterior instrumentation because of the ligamentous, uh, anterior longitudinal ligament destruction. Uh, and also, uh, more commonly, the aid of approach really, you know, uh, require more, you know, um, rely on indirect decompression as well, like in other anterior approaches. When we do lateral interbody fusion, it is less invasive. Uh, usually, blood loss is very, very minimal. Uh, patient recovers very quickly. You again avoid the, you know, posterior uh, structures, carotidina. Uh, and uh, anterior vascular risk is a little bit less than the ALF approach, actually. Um, uh, and the construct is a little bit more space stable than the ALF approach because, number one, you more often or unless, you know, intentionally or unintentionally, anterior longitudinal ligament is disrupted. Uh, it is more stable cages, and it also goes from one apophysial ring to the another, so it is much larger cages, so it is inherently more stable construct than the ALF. Um, and you can achieve great height, height restoration uh, and provide indirect decompressions of the nerves and the, uh, also provide significant release that very beneficial for deformity alignment surgeries. Uh, however, there are quite a few complications being reported. Um, um, there are quite a few, you know, disadvantages, potential bowel injuries, plexus injuries, vascular injuries. And also one of the major disadvantages of the lateral interbody fusion is the inability to access the L5S1. In some cases, it is critical. Uh, again, relies on indirect decompression um, uh, and requires repositioning the patients um, in prone for other posterior procedures more commonly. Um, and lateral position posterior surgeries, uh, there are quite a bit challenges that we can discuss if there's any question. Um, and the lot of surgeons are not familiar. Well, it might be more historical. Uh, uh, at this point, uh, most of the spine surgeons nowadays train to do lateral surgeries, uh, but definitely requires additional training, especially um, during cadaver courses. Oblique interbody fusion is again, it's a less invasive. Uh, there are similar biomechanical advantages like lateral interbody fusion. Um, 
and doesn't you know dissect or transverse the psoas muscle. Um, uh, and uh, one of the main advantage of the oblique approaches because of the space between the you know, approach and the lumbar plexus, um, you know, neuro monitoring may not be required, and you can also have an access to the L5S1. Okay. Um, again, the um, oblique approach also have quite a few disadvantages. Um, there are more common sympathetic chain injuries, uh, bowel injuries, and vascular injuries similarly. And because of the approach, uh, there's a risk of co contralateral foramen violation. Um, again, that relies on indirect decompression and also requires repositioning patients to the front for other posterior procedures. Um, again, the training, uh, a lot of surgeons, you know, again, being trained, be, be comfortable anteriorly, but there's also additional training required. And uh, in oblique approach, if you look at it, actually, um, when we look at the literature, there's quite a bit, you know, publications for the lateral interval diffusion, but um, unfortunately for the oblique approach, the complications are uh, quite limited, actually. Um, if you look at the, you know, some of the publications, the oblique approach reported like, you know, similar tie weakness and, you know, numbness, despite, you know, it's far away from the lumbar plexus, there's still quite a bit, you know, the anterior tie, you know, dysesthesia, hip and quadriceps weakness reported about, you know, 6%. Uh, and there's also another paper, uh, Sylvester reported that there's 2.2% incidence of transitional incisional pain. Uh, and also it's more common to see sympathetic chain disruption because of the autonomic nervous, spine, uh, autonomic nervous system more anteriorly located. When you go more anterior, there's more risk of sympathetic chain injuries uh, reported with the oblique approach. Um, and another paper reported similarly, like 7% uh, transient leg weakness um, and numbness. It's kind of similar to the lateral approach. Um, and the vascular injury is actually, um, uh, again, reported with the oblique approach. Highness reported 1% vascular injuries, Sylvester reported 1.7%, and uh, segmental injuries being reported about 2.8% in small uh, study group. Um, other infrequent reported complication um, in uh, oblique approach uh, is that the, because of the sympathetic chain injuries, sometimes patients reported the temperature discrepancies between the different lower extremities um, um, and Posterior ileus is um, really patient dependent, not necessarily uh, approach dependent. Uh, and most recently, uh, we, you know, a couple of years ago, we started to perform that approach in prone position. Uh, uh, prone transverse surgery uh, or uh, uh, being actually more commonly adapted surgeries. Uh, and here's again, minimally invasive. There are similar biomechanical benefits as the lateral surgery. Um, just because of the, I'm sure there will be other speakers talking about the approaches, uh, uh, you will achieve better sagittal alignment because naturally when you place the patient in prone position, gravity pulls the belly down and then create much more lordotic uh, alignment. Um, and uh, because again, the uh, everything goes more anteriorly, uh, excess window is safer than the lateral approach. Um, and also when you put the legs a little bit more posterior, the plexus move more posteriorly. It's uh, in my experience, it's more forgiving for plexus position. And uh, the positioning is very familiar with the staff, with the other surgeons, uh, you can, uh, perform posterior related procedures in the same positioning. You don't need to perform the, you know, you don't need to flip the patient. Uh, and you can address, you know, you can perform direct decompression. You can do your instrumentation. And the prone position is very familiar with uh, most of the surgeons. Um, um, and if you look at the, you know, the, you know, some of the papers that been coming out uh, related to prone position, uh, that you can see that the segmental load is restored uh, more than the lateral versus the T-lever approach. Um, uh, again, that is because of the just the uh, prone positioning of the patient that allows the patient's 
lumbar spine uh, open up more anteriorly. Again, you can see that, you know, as a case example, uh, that the just, you know, standing versus just in prone position, this space opens up naturally. Um, and uh, one of the things that I observed actually different than the lateral approach in prone position that the in lateral position, we try to, you know, introduce much, much larger trials and much larger cages to achieve the segmental lordosis. Um, and that lead to some more frequent subsidence in prone position, actually. Surgeon, you know, needs to pay attention to not to over distract the segment. Uh, segment is already being opened up. So um, we don't need to try too hard to put, you know, much larger trials to achieve the low doses required uh, because it's just naturally achieved by prone positioning. Uh, and one of the actually, you know, relative contraindication for lateral approach um, in lateral decubitus position was the spondylolisthesis because of the end plate, real, you know, they are not overlapping. So sometimes it's like really difficult to which end plate to target to place your implant. Uh, in prone position, actually you can see that example, the, a lot of times the spondylolisthesis reduction occurs naturally. Um, but, you know, similarly, like every procedures, uh, there are disadvantages in prone position. Uh, again, the possible plexus, bowel, vascular injuries is possible. Again, you will not be able to access the L5S1 level. Um, there is a learning curve. Um, and uh, I done, you know, over 10 years of, you know, lateral decubitus surgeries. Um, and initially, when I thought about the prone position, I was just thinking about like many other surgeons. I'm doing lateral surgery in prone position. What would be the difference? It's quite a bit different, actually. If you, and my observation is that from my fellows, actually, if you don't know the lateral decubitus surgeries and if you haven't performed and you start doing the prone positioning, actually, the adaptation is much more easier and quicker. Uh, because there are things that we kind of like register to our like you know mind what we do during lateral decubitus position actually is different in uh, prone position, uh, such as you know the segment is already corrected significantly, and if you keep trying putting more and more larger implants, there is potential you know um, high risk of anterior longitudinal ligament injuries because the ligament is already being stretched in prone position, and if you try larger implant sizes, then you might rupture the ligaments. Um, and then when that happens, because of the gravity, the stabilization of the cage is a little bit harder than lateral decubitus position. Um, and that happens actually to me once. There are a couple of tips and tricks that we can discuss later that how to address that when that happens. Um, so there's a learning curve. Um, there are quite a few tips and tricks. Um, I strongly, you know, advise to perform a collaborative courses and work with the you know, surgeons that who's done this procedure quite often. Um, uh, and the actually lateral decubitus position has more advantage on performing these procedures in morbidly obese patients. So PTP is actually one of the disadvantages, the morbidly obese patients. Because when you place the patient on the table, um, if the belly is not going inside the table, it just goes outside and then push everything more posteriorly. And the bowels and vessels are gonna be more on your way in prone position and morbidly obese patients. Um, so if the patient is morbidly obese, uh, that lateral decubitus position might be more easier for the procedure than the prone position. I have a you know case example that you know, you know I would like to share. This is seventy four year old uh, patients with predominantly back pain, difficult to stand up straight, uh, pain for last four or five years. Take daily opioids. Uh, patients have significant uh, osteopenia. Uh, you can see that you know patients have significant deformities. There could be a, many different approaches um, uh, to treat this problem. So my current approach is that, you know, I don't perform lateral decubitus surgeries unless absolutely necessary. Um, uh, I do A the first, um, everything has been done in the same day. And then the in prone position, I do uh, lateral transverse uh, uh, implant um, 
um, for the upper lumbar segments. So if you look at the patient's uh, alignment goals being you know, planned before the surgeries, uh, I use custom rods. Um, and if there's any question, I can talk about the planning of the surgeries and the custom implants, how beneficial for the deformity surgeries, plan is to perform, like I said, for the one ALIF, two to four PTP, and T for the pelvis. Um, and uh, this is an uh, images after the ALIF has been performed. Uh, and these are the intraoperative images, and these are the post-op images after the um, uh, deformed surgery. Um, I, you know, a lot of times actually we do uh, during the surgeries um, how to prevent additional surgeries. So currently I do four iliac fixations, four rod in the lumbar spine, and I stabilize them uh, throughout the lumbar spine anteriorly as well. Uh, we review these slides in the for the oblique approach actually. So the um, key points are ADF, lateral, uh, oblique are they're all powerful techniques to achieve achieve a spinal fusion uh, by delivering large interbody grafts. Um, ADF is the safest you know approach for the alpha fs one this space, um, which actually is the most commonly. Uh, if you look at the trend of the surgeries, the ALIF trend is significantly increasing over the country. There are more a and more ALIF surgeries being performed last couple of years than before. Uh, but there is risk of vascular injuries, and the surgeries really depends on the access surgeons. Um, and the lateral interbody fusion requires actually the nerve monitoring. One of the major, you know, the uh, challenges the you know identifying the lumbar plexus. Uh, uh, making sure that you perform the procedure safe through the transverse, uh, you know, tra uh, transversal through the transverse muscle. Uh, oblique approach, one of the major benefit is that the, you know, because you are anteriorly located and um, usually do not require neuromontric, but however, the publications report similar like, risk of the plexus injuries or plexus related symptoms like the lateral interval diffusion. Um, because of the anterior approach, there's a little bit higher risk of vascular injuries. Um, and there's no other reports in terms of fusion rates or the subsidence with the oblique approaches. There's limited publications. Um, and the currently, you know, I think there will be a lot of discussion today throughout the course about the PTP uh, provides better surgical correction. Uh, single position. Uh, position is very familiar with the surgeons and the OR staff. Um, and uh, there are quite a few benefits of the prone position by just patient being prone in the, you know, the OR table. Uh, and the, in conclusion, they are all really great approaches. There are always an indication for each, you know, patients in either one of these, um, but the, these are very unique approaches. Uh, it's the execution and associated complication depends on the patient, it depends on surgeon's familiarity. Um, and because of the large, you know, interbody graft, and they all provide similarly high fusion rates. Um, and op optimal approach depends heavily on the individual structural con constraints of the pathology, an anatomy of the individual patients, and familiarity of the surgeons. <clears throat> That's terrific, Vidat. Um, so I have a couple questions, and I think Luis and uh, Paul and some of the faculty might. Sure. Is so it sounds to me. Um, like in your practice, you do a lifts, uh, you do o lifts, and then you do prone and you do lateral. Would that be correct? Well, I don't do all it. I tried once. Yeah. And, uh, I well, I I was doing another deformity surgery. Like the olive was becoming quite you know popular, and I really like to do the L five S one interbody you know uh, implant placement. So I like you know having a cage like the L five S one. That's why in one case I tried to, you know, the olive and uh, we got into the vessel. So then that was my only case and I don't do olive. And I stopped doing, you know, lateral decubitus a couple of years ago. I mean, I still do. Uh, yeah. And I still do for a few indications like in thoracic spine, I do lateral decubitus position uh, because in prone position, because of the position of the axis is very limited in the thoracic spine. Um, and in a couple of cases that, you know, it was a revision TLF cases that um, 
and I felt a little bit more comfortable doing the revision with the um, lateral decubitus position. But now my to-go procedure is PTP. And I'm sure I can teach Louis a couple tips and tricks on PTP. Yeah. Um, and and let's say on that one case that you showed, so I think you had, did you do a T-lift at the bottom or was that an A-lift? Oh, that was A-lift. There were, there was, I, I, I stopped doing T-lift. I can't talk about an hour. Yeah. <laughs> about how I dislike the tail uh, I think yeah. a lot of surgery is still the most common procedure I think being performed uh, and I'm sure in presentation people show beautiful cases done with the tail uh, restoring the lower doses and spondylolisthesis but if you look at the you know the tail approach I think it is not reproducible uh, it's a small access to the disc space and you put <clears throat> you put your instruments blindly. Uh, there's much higher risk of end plate violation. And with the current expandable cages, I think if you are not really releasing enough, if you keep extend, expanding it, I think you will see a lot of subsidence. Uh, I mean, I can, and there's not reliable, you know, this kind of restoration. Um, and also, you know, if you are in an academic institution, uh, it's not uncommon to see one cases every week that you are revising TLF that because it's not fused, cage migrated, um, and subsidence, etc. So uh, my TLF actually, if I do still, I mean, it's a great procedure, don't get me wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. I only do if it is a single level disease, and I, if I don't like to go anteriorly or laterally for anatomical reasons. And do you have an access surgeon if you're doing an A lift, or do you? Do you yeah, that's we are you? we are blessed. We are lucky. We have actually not just one. We have great, you know, three, four yeah. access surgeons. They just open up the spine inter. I mean, the A lift is such a simple procedure for spine surgeon. So, access surgeon opens up. You just go in there. In 15 minutes, you kind of clean the disc up and put the gauges in. I mean, um, I think that's the quickest spine surgery we do. Uh, but really, it is really excess surgeon dependent. And I, I do. Every every patient's, every long fusions, I do ALF on L5S1 especially. Yeah. So then you've got, so like on that case, uh, do you do, so tell me your sequence. So you do ALF first? So I do ALF first in the morning. So the, my access surgeon opens up in 30 minutes. And... Uh, then I go do two level A lift. It doesn't take more than 30 minutes to do two level A lift actually. Uh, then I place the patient to prone next and I do the PTP uh, two or three levels, L1 to L5. I really believe that the deformity is the, all the lumbar segments in type of fusion needs to be performed um, because I seen all the implant fracture related complications, fusions, these patients are most often very elderly. And even though when you fuse them, the bad, bad bone quality, bad fusion quality. I seen patients, I took patients back with, you know, broken construct because when you open up, it looks like beautifully fused, but when you touch the bone, it just cracks easily. Um, so yes, I do place them in prone. I do the PTP and then I do the posterior uh, next. So that's a long day. Do you or do you break it up? No, I mean I, I'm usually you know done around like three four o'clock. Okay, so you've got then. I'll, so, I'll give you one example. The benefit of yeah. the problem. Uh, so similar deformity surgery. We did the A lift and then we did the PTP. The cages are placed. So my sequence is actually I put my screws first freehand and then I bring the OR and spin the OR and look at the screw location. So, uh, and then we spin the OR. Uh, next thing what you see is that, the, you know, when we put the screw, sometimes it goes to the disc space. So the fellow side, both screws at three and L4, they are both in the disc space and push the cages to the front. You can mm -hmm. see that both screws. I have actually some images uh, in some other presentation. So both cages migrated, you know, anteriorly that on the PTP cages. So if you think about that, if you've done the lateral decubitus position and if the prone, if the cage is migrated because the screw pushing the cage is the front, then you need to reposition the patient to lateral decubitus position, open it up, reposition the cages. So in my cases, actually, it was like, oh, we already have an access if the you know, surgical field is prepared. So we took the screw out, 
we open up the lateral incision and replace the cages and lock it up. Uh, so even though it was kind of complication during the surgeries or unexpected events, uh, that was an easy access. So I went back to the front and fixed the problem. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that. Um, Luis or Paul, any comments? The, the, I, I saw that in your graphics, you, when you mention olive, you put a smaller cage. You think that because this procedure has a smaller cage, we would have more subsidence? Do you have this data? No, there's, I, there's the olive actually, I don't know why, but there's not enough publication on the olive compared to exif actually, or lateral approach. I think, I think number one reason is that maybe it's not as common as the lateral decubitus approach. Um, and I think initially when it started, when I was seeing the cases being presented, I was calling it as like, you know, anterior t leaf approach uh, because the cage was much smaller. Uh, and it wasn't really going from one apophysis to another. I think now the you know the surgeon who does a lot of olive actually they do similar actually they go anterior, and then start going more and more perpendicular to the disc space instead of oblique to place their larger cages to, to achieve a better segmental low doses. But I agree, like similar to the T-lip, like if you are just opening up the disc and putting a cage in there, if you are not releasing the contralateral you know, to analysts, I think the subsidence risk is much higher because of the small cages. And also, you know, I was always concerned about the control lateral foramen. I seen some cases that the cage was in the control lateral foramen as well. Um, uh, I personally don't have a lot of clinical experience with the olive. I did one cases so far and it wasn't pleasant. Uh, you mentioned also that in your hands, oh, in your hands, uh, in theory, uh, lateral is more stable than alif, right? The, yes, yes, because the, you are so not disrupting the ALF. If the ALF is not disrupted, you are just opening each side of the analyst and it's a larger cage. If this is the case, why in L4-5 you, you, you make your approach surgeon struggle uh, and do ALIF in five in four five is all about lower doses. You don't think that in PTP you have enough lower doses in 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 prone? I, I I used to do that, but my access surgeon is so it's so easy for them to open up to four five. I think it is really my practice, and what do I have an access and. Um, and like everybody else, L4-5 is a little bit trickier when you do lateral approach. Um, I still do, you know, lateral, you know, prone, like 4-5. Uh, if I'm doing like short lumber L2 to 5, L3 to 5, I do, you know, PTP. Uh, but I am lucky that my access surgeon literally takes 30 minutes to expose from L4 to S1. It is more, it's more about like, you know, having a good access surgeon. It's not about my preference, actually. Yeah, my last question is, uh, in your hands, the gen scoliosis that doesn't have a major sagittal alignment, you always go to 5-1 if 5-1 is degenerated? Yes. And uh, I believe, you know, we can talk about this planning and the alignments and how it is important and even in degenerative cases that uh, we really need to correct the alignment in lumbar spine. Even if you are doing two level L4 to S1, if you don't, there's 10 times higher risk of adjacent segment disease and revision surgery. So, you know, when you said that, you know, when the sagittal alignment is not that bad, like, you know, I think everybody, it doesn't matter one, you know, 10 degrees, 20 degrees or 40 degrees, they are all misaligned and they are all needs to be corrected. And you definitely achieve much, much better alignment correction with the 5-1 ALF because of the lumbar look. It's not only, only the alignment. You also need to align properly per level. I mean, there are papers that if you don't, then the apex of the curvature migrates higher 
And when the apex migrates higher, adjacent segment disease and PJK risk is much higher if your apex of the lumbar cur cur lumbar lower dose is higher levels. Like if, you if you're achieving more lower dose in the mid lumbar spine, and if you're not getting it from the L5S1, you're moving the apex of the lumbar curvature to the higher lumbar segments to the L1 and L2. And that leads to more risk of adjacent segment disease, especially if you are doing like T10 pelvis construct and much higher PJK rate. So it's not only the correcting the number, you also need to correct more harmonious lumbar load doses throughout the lumbar spine. So it is really important to achieve proper significant load doses from the L5 S1. But then when you go to, to S1, you go to the to the iliac as well? Yes. Absolutely. Sacrum is not a good fixation. It's a you need to go to the pelvis. It's a bigger procedure. Yeah. The patient also lose part of the mobility or not? Um, you mean like... Yeah. like SI joint mobility? I, I mean, uh, the result of a, a three-level lateral is very different from a three-level lateral plus a lift plus uh, iliac screws. The, the Compared to motion in 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 cleaning themselves and things like that. So the major, like when I talk to my patients, um, I tell them, you know, you are going to be able to walk. You are going to be able to stand better. The major limitation is going to be reaching to tie your shoes. And, you know, wiping yourself also might be difficult. Uh, that is correct. Uh, but the alternative is not that great either. So what's the alternative? Like, if you are not going to the pelvis, those patients are going to come back for additional surgeries. They, are, they go through 10, 15 more surgeries when they develop pseudoarthrosis, when they start falling down, if you're not going down to the pelvis. So... Um, I mean, I personally seen so many surgeries fail by not going to the pelvis. Yes, it's a trade-off. They lose flexibility, yeah. but they gain so much functionality uh, because of the deformity correction. Thanks, Vidar. That was a great talk. And obviously, we miss you, but I appreciate you uh, right. joining. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to go to our next talk. Um, Dr. Paul.